Hello and welcome to Aspiring Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. Each week, we'll be chatting with various leaders from all different walks of life, learning from their experiences and sharing their advice. It's the perfect podcast for somebody wishing to step into a new leadership role or for a leader who's already there wishing to continue their development. If you'd like, share and subscribe to the podcast. Happy Thursday, everybody. As always, you're very welcome along to this week's episode of Aspiring Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. Uh, maybe actually a quick check-in uh, to kick things off on what the podcast is about. So kicked it off uh, 17 or 18 weeks ago now at this stage. And the, the, the aim of the podcast is three things, really. Number one, to create a learning space for any of the listeners who want to develop their leadership style um, by learning from other leaders. Number two, it's an opportunity for uh, people who are wishing to move into a leadership role, who want to understand how others have done it and made the transition through their career. And number three, it's an opportunity for the guests to have a space to reflect on how successful they've been and hopefully enhance their confidence and allow them to push on further with their with their life and with their jobs. So this week is no different. Uh, we have another guest set up this week. But before I get to that, a quick thank you to last week's guest, Mary McHugh. Got a lot of good feedback about her. Hugely down-to-earth character. Shared a lot of practical advice that can help us both professionally and personally. Um, she shared it from a a counselling perspective but also as a lady who's grown her own organisation and some of the learnings that she's taken there from a leadership perspective so I'd encourage you if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to it go back and listen to it and a lot of the other episodes because all of the guests are exciting people and have great things to share with us so on to this week's coaching question and it's a really powerful question that I came across when I was studying um, my coaching diploma and, and I love to ask it, and it's really simple, but you can ask it towards yourself in any area of your life right now. But the question is really simple. If you're saying yes to something, what are you saying no to? Um, so again, maybe it's a goal that you're looking to, to achieve, or maybe it's a particular habit that you have that isn't serving you well. But by saying yes to that particular thing, what are the things that you're saying no to? And it's always important to understand that because even when we're moving forward and being successful in our life there can be a certain element of loss and it's important to prepare yourself for that as a person and be aware of those things so that you're you can fully commit to the to the new version of yourself or the new habit that you might be looking to to achieve so that's the question for the week if you're out hopefully we have a i hear there's a really sunny weekend so if you're out the back relaxing or on the beach uh having a walk maybe have a think about that question and and see what what comes up for yourself Okay, good stuff. So moving on to this week's guest. Interestingly enough, <laughs> it's funny how things happen. I went to Kingstown College uh, to study to be a coach and it was hugely beneficial for me. What it allowed me to do was I had been coaching for a while previous to that, but it allowed me to put a certain element of structure and then understand what I was doing, why I was doing it, and then be able to communicate that effectively and also repeat it consistently. Um, so you can be, so I was able to be more effective then as a coach over a consistent period of time. Found it hugely beneficial, but met Alan there. And then completely out of the blue, myself and my wife were getting married um, and we hired... <laughs> We hired the musicians that were in the venue the day that we went there to view it and Alan happened to be the musician but it, we didn't make the connection until a later point when I spoke with him again and, and he had played at the wedding so he's an excellent musician but as you'll, you'll hear from this he's also a phenomenal coach uh, he, he works as a lecturer as well in Kingstown College and he's a brilliant musician too and an all-around good guy I thoroughly enjoyed the chat and I'm excited to share it with you so without speaking about it um anymore because genuinely we touch on so many interesting topics uh, i'm excited to share it so let's go over to alan and get the conversation started one second now all right hey alan uh thanks a million for popping along to this week's podcast what 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 i didn't realize and what you didn't realize was until until a while ago is that you actually were the musician that made mine and my wife's wedding a few years ago uh which was mad to think but um, where I originally met Alan and the reason that he's come along on the podcast is because he's a lecturer in Kingstown College. So we might just start off with that a little bit, Alan, if you want to talk us through maybe some of your experiences and your own role at the moment. 
I, I love the way you brought my alter ego into this conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my role at Kingstown College, I, I have a number of hats at Kingstown College. Um, I, I pay the price for being a very creative and a busy minded person. Um, in that I, I lecture for the college. I, I'm an exec, executive, uh, can't talk. I'm an executive coach for Kingstown College. Um, but I also look after the, the marketing of what we do as well. Um, because of my background, I worked in TV and media for a number of years, ran my own business. Um, so I've, I've kind of touched all the different areas of, of an organization, but it all comes back down to the fact that when I was about 19 or 20, uh, I did my first ICF coaching course. And it was, and this to show you how old I am really, Conal, um, it was over the phone, <laughs> it was a remote coach, a uh, remote course, uh, which was delivered over the phone. And ever since that, coaching has been a huge part of, of what I do. Um, and I don't, I don't want to kind of preempt what we're going to talk about later, but um, it, it's it's definitely a huge part of what I do and and I, the benefit of it as an approach and as a philosophy just is, is, is absolutely magnificent. 19 or 20, God, Alan, I was very young. How did you find coaching in the first place at, at such a young age? So when I was uh, when I was in school, uh, I think everybody experiences where the, the career guidance teacher from the school starts dropping into your classes, you know, maybe what was, was supposed to be a geography class, the geography teacher got the, got the class off and, and the teacher, arrived, or the career guidance counselor arrived in with brochures for all the colleges. And, you know, there was Trinity, there was UCD, there was UCC in Cork, there was all these different uh, amazing universities that we all know and love and respect. And everybody was jumping on those ones. And at the very back, there was this one that nobody else seemed to be going near, which was called the National College of Industrial Relations. And I saw this and went, that sounds really intriguing. I wonder what that is. Picked up the brochure and read about what at the time was, was personnel management and had just about been rebranded as HR. And the more I read about this, the more I fell in love with it. And then I filled out my CAO form, which is my, uh, my college application. It had one course on it. So when you did 10 options for degrees and 10 options for diploma level, I had one course and it was the Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and Human Resource Management at the National College of Ireland because they had literally just rebranded them that year as well. So that was that was where it all started, this this love for, for industrial relations and HR and how people work together. The more I learned about it, I started to realize that coaching is sound. I, I liked the idea of one to one conversations that benefit people. Uh, counseling and therapy didn't seem to quite fit with what I was talking about or what where my values were um, whereas when I found coaching I was like that that's the thing I was looking for a word for to, to describe that's the thing that's where it all came from well you hedged your bets there but it worked out well yeah I'm here talking to you I mean <laughs> <laughs> how good could it have gone it's fantastic um, yeah it, it was it just it, it spoke to me it was what I wanted to do you as you mentioned there with your introduction, you've worked so many different roles throughout your life and I'm sure it required loads of different skills. How have you evolved, Alan, to be able to move from role to role and lead your own business to where you are now as a lecturer and executive coach at Kingston? I think the, the answer to that, Colonel, is very simple. It's that you can't stop learning. I mean, if, you, if, I, if I just took what I learned in my degree, and I, I did law as my postgrad, so I had actually planned to move into arbitration. That was the direction I was hoping to, to go to. And at that point, economies were a bit weird because it wouldn't have been long after the Twin Towers and, and then we were faced into a recession. So uh, things were a bit strange and I ended up actually running my own business, which turned out to be a good thing. But that's a different story for a different podcast. Um, but the, the, the continuous learning, the ability to look at a situation and not be freaked out by it, but say, okay, th there is clearly a path forward here. We just need to discover what it is. It's helpful if it's the one of least resistance. But if we, if we develop ourselves and develop our skill set as we go, then we're always going to be relevant. If, if you take the extreme example of if you studied a, a computer science or programming degree back in 2000, 2001, when I was studying, you would be completely irrelevant right now. And I think the same is, is, is relevant. Is, is the same story applies to leadership and management. If you're not moving, if you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not going to be relevant. For a different project and different bit of research we were doing a few months back, I actually went into my parents' attic and I took out all the books from my, um, from my HR degree. I just started flicking through them. Values is is everything that we teach at Kingstown College. Everything hangs on a person's values. Most people don't know what they are, but it, it, it is the thing that we lean on 
as we as we teach courses in, in coaching and mentoring for, for individuals and for organizations. That took up in a book about about three or four inches thick, values took up one paragraph in that book, which was published in nineteen ninety seven. Wow. It just and shows you how much things are involved. Yeah, it's everywhere. Absolutely. Um, you've mentioned Kingstown College several times, and it was one of the main reasons that I, that I wanted to get you on here to talk about. What exactly is Kingstown College? We're, we're a little bit boutique in what we do, <laughs> uh, because if, you, if you're not looking for education in the space of coaching or mentoring, you probably wouldn't have heard of us. But if you are, and you are from that space, you would know that we're a really, really big player in that space. Um, what we do at Kingstown College is we, we offer a, an accredited set of courses, uh, accredited with the International Coach Federation, which is ICF, and the European Mentoring and Coaching Council, EMCC. Uh, and those courses will be in the space of what, what you might have traditionally known as life coaching, but that has now evolved and turned into lots of different things. And then mentoring, which is a different thing. Uh, but but equally relevant in especially in, in organizations where they may have coaching and mentoring programs uh, but life coaching is probably what people would have first heard that the term associated with but now executive coaching and workplace coaching career coaching uh, well-being coaching financial coaching uh, the list just goes on and the reason the list can go on is that coaching in particular coaching is not something that you do Coaching is a way you could do everything. It's a way of having a conversation. It's a way of, of building on the skills of listening and asking great questions by you know, asking better questions and listening even deeper so that we can really understand what's happening for an individual who we're sitting in front of. And that could be an employee or it could be a close friend. But either way, we're, as human beings, we're not used to listening to each other. We're used to story swapping. We're not used to really, truly listening. And when we do that, we can understand that maybe in this performance conversation that I'm having with this employee at the start of our, of our, our reported year, maybe the target I had planned to give them is far less ambitious than the one they wanted to set for themselves. But I would never know that if I didn't ask. So <laughs> this, this idea of asking rather than telling um, is really what's revolutionizing leadership um, in, in, in the last five to 10 years. Oh, only today I seen that happen. I was having a conversation with my own team and we were setting expectations for April. And I had a minimum expectation in mind that was way lower than actually what the guys chose themselves. But I wouldn't have known that if I had just come and imposed that on them. Um, I, I was lucky enough to spend some time in Kingstown College and every day, every hour, I still use so many, many of the tools and techniques that I learned from the facilitators. You might tell me a little bit about some of the people that are involved there and the team that you have. I, I will, but just there's, there's a quick, can I share a quick story with yeah, you? Yeah, go for before it. I do that, just about listening um, and leadership. Um, in, in a previous life, I worked for a TV production company and my, my job was very like coaching, actually. I was the, the person sitting off camera interviewing people. So you'd never hear me, but I was the one who asked the questions that got the great sound bites out of the other person, right? Um, but I'm, I'm, I live here in, in South Kildare and delighted to be joining you from my house rather than the, the commute today. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, but just, just across the road from me is uh, a place many people might know, which is Punchestown Racecourse. And I had the great pleasure of interviewing a man called Dick O'Sullivan a number of years ago. Uh, and Dick came into Punchestown as the general manager when the race course was, it was nowhere near as successful as it is right now. Nowhere near it. But Dick is about 80 years of age. And he took the gig of general manager at about 80. That, that's just powerful, right? But he, on his first day, nobody knew who he was. So he arrived at, at the course, put on a pair of boots um, and was dressed very, very kind of dressed down. He looked like an old man going for a walk on the race course. And he walked out and there was a guy out there who was who had a fork and a shovel or something like that. And he was what he was doing was repairing the, the, the race course. So all the hoof marks that could cause a jockey to break their neck, he was making sure they were all repaired. And he went out and spoke to the guy for for an hour. And this guy was a very with respect would be perceived as a lowly maintenance worker on on the on the on the course and he spoke to him for an hour and he, he recalls that story and he said i got my five-year plan from that conversation 
that's wow. leadership. That's that's being prepared to listen. Because the guy, he's hearing all the punters talking. He's hearing all the staff talking. And he was able to tell him what's wrong with this, this course. Why are people not coming here? What are the ideas other people have had that will be great? Because I'm standing out here in the middle of a field where it's cold over the all day to think about the idea that somebody talked about two days ago. And now I'm relaying it to the new general manager. He just didn't know he was the new general manager. Can I, can I follow that, that path, uh, Alan, because it's, it's a really interesting topic, but there's, uh, there's so much books, uh, there's so many courses, and you spoke about the, the importance of listening and asking questions. And even though in some books, let's say Brené Brown's book, Dare to Lead, she doesn't call it coaching, right? But that's what she's talking about, you know, that empathy, the questions, the listening. What's the reason that it's not leveraged as much as it could be, do you think? Insecurity. What do you mean by that now? The leader who believes they cannot lead and doesn't deserve the salary or the benefits if they don't know the answer. They've equated knowledge with the position. I'm kind of more of a, um, a Steve Jobs approach, which is like you don't hire smart people and then tell them what to do. That the leader who can who can walk into a room and facilitate a conversation that gets everybody's brain onto the table and then put all the amazing stuff together. That's the leader who delivers great results. I had a lecturer in college and he described it really well. He said, like, a manager works on the system, not in the system. And if, if you're constantly a subject matter expert within each of your team's disciplines, you haven't time to work on the system or work on the team and work on the strategy because you're too busy trying to become as good as everybody else around the table at the thing that they're spending all day trying to be as good as they can be at it. It's never going to work. The, the hours just don't add up. And the, the, the barrier for, 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 I think for leaders is walking in, especially young leaders, is where they walk into a room and they think, I, if I don't know everything, they're going to see right through me. That's a concern. It leads to stress, it leads to well being issues. And it's all unnecessary because it's that approach that has led to the, the ineffectiveness of the team altogether. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and, <laughs> it was a tumbleweed there for Mama No, Cole. <laughs> no, I was, just, I was just letting it sit. I was just letting it sit for effect. Uh, I completely agree. And it, it's, that, it's that need to be, to be wanted and to be liked and feel like you're, you're solving problems. Like, and, and it's addictive too, because it's kind of an adrenaline sort of thing with it as well. Um, yeah, values. Tell me about the importance of values. So, and in particular, in relation to leadership. Okay, this is definitely another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, well, I'm about to go off on one again here. Go, go for it. Me. Go Stop for me. it. You bought it up, so let's talk about it. <laughs> so values, values and leadership and people and organizations. Okay. Um, I, I remember lecturing a, a, a class for Kingstown College uh, probably about three years ago, and there was a gentleman there whose name I will not I will not mention, but he was about sixty five or so. So he was one of the more more senior people who have who have taken the course with us. Um, he decided having finished his working life, he was going to study something that he would like to maybe have as a little kind of a part time thing that he does just to remain purposeful in, in, in his retirement years. Um, they'd just done an exercise on values where they just in front of a flip chart back in those days when we were in a classroom, just they wrote down as many values as they could think of. Um, and at the end of the exercise, when they were bringing everybody back together, he just he put his hand up. He says, can I just say something for a moment? And clearly i said yes of course go for it um and he said i'm 65 and he says i can tell you now i have never thought about what my values are and to be honest i don't think i really know what they are the problem with that is that our values and how deeply ingrained they are with us they will determine the things that feel right and the things that don't feel right after the fact but if we're aware of our values, we can start making the decisions that are going to make us feel happy or not happy after the fact. So basically, we can get ahead of the decision. We can get ahead of the feeling. 
to, to bring that into the organizational example. When we were designing a, a, a workshop around culture and corporate culture uh, about two years ago, um, I, I just I was trying to just figure out a way of connecting some of the coaching language to to, to how we might describe a culture. And the best I could, could arrive at was that a company culture is the result of the dominant values in action. The dominant values may be the ones that have been recruited deliberately by HR, or they could be the leader of the day. So what you could end up with is on the wall when you walk in, you see a value statement at reception, which says, we value honesty, openness, and transparency. But then you go five floors up and you have a complete closed door policy and people who are just covering their ass because they are the leaders of the day and it's their values in action that create the culture. It doesn't really matter what's written on the wall. If you've seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, it's a great example of corporate values. It, it, was, it was completely outrageous but it worked because they all shared the same values. They might not be your values, they might not be mine, but like-minded people came together and therefore it made millions and millions of dollars. A bit loose about the whole regulations and the, the law part of it, but it, it worked. But they had values, yeah. Yeah. So a values fit happens at, at, at several different levels, but if a company doesn't know its values, and the leaders don't know the values to enforce and HR don't know the values to recruit. And then on top of that, you add in the fact that individuals are not fully aware of their own values. We, we have brewing here a, a perfect recipe for corporate HR disaster. And we find out about it too late. We find out about it in the Employment Appeals Tribunal because it's turned into conflict and now it's all about something totally different. But it started because we didn't think about values, because individuals didn't know their own when they came into the organization. And the organization didn't really know theirs either. And now opposite values end up conflicting with each other. And now we have a row. Yeah, I completely agree. On two points, like uh, so many people I would coach, um, tackling the values challenge or the values opportunity is one of the key areas that helps them overcome so much. And believe it or not, from a personal perspective, when I when I go for a new job now, not that I've gone for that many new jobs, but the first thing I go to is the company's website and I go company values, which is something I wouldn't have done prior to having maybe gone to Kingstown and explored the whole coaching area. Tell me, we've spoken a little bit about values, but you also mentioned earlier on that uh, a leader who isn't you know learning and progressing is stagnant what are some of the key hot topics that a leader needs to be on top of now that, that you guys cover in kingstown do you remember a little while ago i said coaching is a way we can do everything and that's probably the the advantage of coaching it's it's why it's so popular it's why people are embracing it as a leadership style uh, because you can tackle a conflict you can tackle a performance ambition you can tackle um a well-being challenge you could tackle the whole working from home um and remote working and blended working um all through a coaching dialogue and a coaching conversation where we start off making sure we understand ourselves individually and then we can come together as a team confident that we're we're, we're talking about our position and what it truly is rather than being hijacked by an unexpected trigger that just didn't sit with our values if, if a leader of today is, is, is trying to remain relevant, they have to listen. They have to listen to their team. They have to listen to their industry, listen to their market, and understand what's, what's out there. Understand what's happening for others and what's happening for them. But there was an article in the Irish Times at the very early stages of, of lockdown in, in March 2020, and within the article or could be the headline or within it somewhere it said that remote working is exposing woolly leadership and when you dig into it a little more what we're discovering is that so many old school leaders i'm not saying 
old leaders. I'm saying old school. There are some very young people who are old school in their thinking and their leadership. So I'm not saying you must be over 50 to apply <laughs> for this to be relevant to you. But if, if, if we think about that, that, that older school leadership, many of them got their, their energy and got their next order or action or, or deliverable from walking around the office. There were prompts that, that just moved them into action. But when, when the entire team became remote in March, all bets were off because at this point the leader now needed to measure by deliverables not measure by them being present and sitting at their desk and they didn't have a club in their bag for that they also um could no longer depend on the body language element of it what there, there were some stories i heard anecdotally of of Microsoft Teams meetings or Zoom meetings where, you know, the person who was the leader of the team was now the person who wasn't great on Zoom, who didn't know how to, how to, um, how to host that kind of a virtual meeting, didn't know how to, to enforce the deliverables that could be measured by those who are working from home and found themselves no longer the leader of the group in effect. They may have had the title, the title was 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 allowing them the position of manager but socially they may no longer have been the leader that position could have been you know uh, in terms of, of a little mini society could have actually shifted over to, to the person who now appears like the leader mm-hmm. um you, you would especially see that from people who are very tall and have a presence to an organization were now reduced to four inches on a screen and they didn't have that to lean on anymore is that necessarily a bad thing? I think it brings a certain level of democracy to a team. And I also think it focuses us on outcomes rather than outputs. You know, I, I, I saw, there was a little, little cartoon thing I saw during the week where, where it was um, somebody who had just fired loads of arrows and said, I've reached my hourly target. I've fired 50 arrows and the arrows are just everywhere. You know, and then the, the cartoon beside it is that I've hit my target and it's just one arrow in the middle of a, bun, of a bullseye. And, and, and that's the difference between output and outcome. What do we actually want to achieve here or as an organization or as a team? And if we've done that, does it really matter if everybody's in the same building? Does it really matter that we finished at 3.30 today instead of 4.30 today? Because if we've just blown our sales targets out of the water, how does that how does me sitting in the office for an extra hour really make that much of a difference to our outcomes as a team if we don't have the measurables we're we're basing leadership and we're basing control on something that isn't connected with the organizational goals and organization objectives and and i just i, I think that's a shift that's happening especially with remote teams we we can't we can't base everything on just being present anymore um, and be that from the employee's point of view, where they feel, if I'm not present, I'm not contributing and I'm feeling a bit insecure about that. So I think maybe leadership and the individuals in the team need to have a serious chat and serious conversation about how are we going to do our best work together. And, and really, there's nowhere to hide going forward for either leadership or the team members themselves. I think that's the interesting dynamic that we're going to see play out when COVID decides to go on its merry way and we have to figure out how are we going to do this long-term. From the people you would work with and and coach Alan and your own experience, what are some key things to stay on top of from a remote perspective to ensure that you are um, getting those results that you speak about there? It's a great coaching question. I'm sure you would have asked uh, during your, your, your time, um, it's what I'm thinking to myself yeah. now all the time. <laughs> what, what does success look like yeah. for the team? And what does success look like for the organization? And maybe you're, you're leading a team within an organization that itself doesn't know what success looks like. It hasn't had that conversation at C-suite level yet in order for it to filter down. 
and, and some sometimes that especially during maybe a crisis mode that we could find organizations in at the moment is that they, they just want everybody to be busy and doing lots of stuff while they figure out what the hell's going to happen next but at least we all look productive so our shareholders will be happy <laughs> a lot so, of projects going on <laughs> yeah a, lot, a huge amount of projects going on we're not sure where it's going to bring us but look there's arrows everywhere over the last hour so we're cool we're, it's all, it looks good um yeah organizations are being asked to at, at senior management at senior leadership level ask them to look to look into a crystal ball about what's next and with the best will in the world many of them don't know they don't know what their industry is going to look like i was talking to a friend of mine today we talked about wedding at the start of our conversation a friend of mine who's a, a an owner operator of a um a family-run hotel and he doesn't know what it's going to look like. How quickly is the wedding industry going to jump back into action again? How confident are people to, you know, to, to book that, that event and that date with how many people? Will people want to go? What's it going to look like? How long is it going to take to get back up to the turnover that they were used to that sustained their business and their, and their financial commitments as a business? They don't know. They're making best guesses. And with that comes an insecurity. Mm. Tell I completely me. lost your question. What was the question? No, it's, you it's okay. I was, yeah, I was. You were. I was asking about what success would look like. I suppose right now, from a remote perspective, uh, to ensure that a leader is getting the best from their team, what are some of the key things that they can stay on top of? But I think, think you spoke about it a little bit there. It's, the, it's the uncertainty. It's, and you mentioned as well that there's so much projects going on, and people are just trying to look busy because maybe the organization itself hasn't that clarity that it needs. That brings a well-being challenge and a stress challenge as well, because if, if we know the thing we need to achieve and we achieve it, we get that little dopamine hit in our heads and box ticked, and that's cool. We can celebrate that. But if we're just being busy and doing lots of things, but not knowing where we need to go, we're, we're constantly a little bit anxious and a little bit stressed because we don't know what success looks like. We don't know when we've achieved the thing that's going to be acknowledged by our, our leadership or the thing that our customers want. And, and therefore, there's this constant little state of, of, of a cortisol shot into our body where we're kind of ready for, ready for the danger wherever it might present itself because we don't know which of all these 20 million things we could be doing right now is the right five that I need, I need to do to guarantee the success of my team or my company. So the well-being challenge around it, I think, is one that leadership need to step up about and have defined some form of a goal or some form of, a, of an outcome where we can say, yes, we have achieved this thing. That is really, really good. High five. I think people need that. Otherwise, there's just so many things they could be doing, which of them are really, really important right now to achieve something. And if you're a leader who's kind of trapped in the middle where you're not getting something from from the the higher levels of the organization then you need to create your own you need to take control in some way because you've got to protect your team your team need while working from home or when they start blending their their work week they need to have some form of a time or or a, an occasion where they can say yes that is now done otherwise it's just constantly constantly there it's constantly a demand it never finishes um, and as leaders if, if we can if we can take a moment to figure out what those measurables would look like it benefits us as a leader and it be benefits our team from the point of view of them getting to that point where they know they've, they've done something really really important this week and they can now box it off um, and, and from the well-being point of view that they're they're able to be the best version of themselves with their families as well because right now they're they're living where they work and that can be difficult to switch off from mm. and, and that'll help provide that little bit of clarity that you say you know is missing because the uncertainty of just the the uncontrollables around us tell me alan w one thing that i i'm fascinated to understand from from all the guests that i have and i'm sure you've worked with lots of people in the coaching space around this but 
how do leaders that you observe and have worked with, how do they move from role to role? Let's say somebody who's an individual computer or <laughs> individual computer, individual <laughs> contributor to get their first leadership role and then move, maybe move from that frontline manager role to a director and so forth. What are some of the key things that help them other than the learning that we spoke about earlier on? Uh, key things, to, to, sorry, to move into their first leadership role, is it? Yeah, and, and, and then I suppose from there upwards. Um, I think, was it Daniel Goleman? No, it wasn't Daniel Goleman. It was, emotional intelligence is obviously his space, but mm. who said it? I think it was somebody, they said that IQ will get you in the door, but EQ gets you up the ladder. Okay. Okay, so your, your IQ, your intelligence will get you in the door through an interview but it's your emotional intelligence that will get you up through the leadership um, leadership of the organization. Um, I think if you have emotional intelligence where you can, you can be a leader and a manager. So a manager, in my view, will be somebody who, who controls the controllables. Okay, so the, man, the manager is the, is the one who has the Excel spreadsheet and the Gantt chart, and they're, they're managing it from that point of view. The leader is the one that recognizes Alan's not really feeling himself today there's something going on there i'm going to have a coffee with him today and just see what's happening there that's that's leadership from the front and being able to spot the human element of it um a leader with no followers is just a man out for a walk i think it's one, it's one of john maxwell's ones if you're not bringing people with you you're not a leader um if they don't want to follow you you're not a leader you're a manager and it's that leadership piece connected to emotional intelligence is what will help you move through the organization if you can blend that with a sense of commercial awareness, knowing what your company does, knowing how you fit into it, and knowing how the next two layers above you fit into that picture, that's when you become spotted and noticed as having what we call leadership potential. That you, you can lead people because of your EQ, which your commercial awareness means, means you can lead them and the team and the results in the direction that the company is going. I know, I'm just conscious of the time here, and I, I know it could be opening a can of worms, right? But emotional intelligence, right? It's it's talked about a lot. It's bandied about a lot. And I know in Kingstown, it's it's part of the executive and leadership coaching course. But in as, in as nicely packaged as you possibly can, what is what is emotional intelligence? Okay, I, I, can, I, can I give you a team four layers, but I'll try and be Go for it, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, so we look at it this way. It's about self-awareness and self-management. Okay, so knowing who you are and what you are, including your values and your emotions, then being able to manage them. Okay, so they're, they're the first two elements of emotional intelligence. Then we're into social awareness. So now I know who I am and I can manage who I am. So when I'm in a meeting and somebody else is maybe getting a little angry or somebody else is being a bit dejected and pulling back. I'm so in control of me that I can now start being aware of socially what's happening around me. And then relationship management means, do I pull them aside for a coffee? That's emotional intelligence. It starts with getting your own stuff together, knowing who you are, what you are, how you tick, what triggers you, then figuring out a way to manage it. When you've got that sorted, you've got your space under control, that's when you're, you can then lift your head up and start looking around you at the other relationships that you are, are connected with either in work or at home. And you can start then being sensitive to those and then reaching out to those and, and being the leader. The leader is the person who has everything that they need to control under control to such a degree that they can now start serving and helping others around them to be the best they can be brilliant yeah it makes perfect sense um i i'm lucky enough to be part of david clutterbook's uh coaching supervision group at the moment and it's it's brilliant to learn from the other coaches if 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 nothing else but his questions are his questions are so simple but so effective at the same time uh he wrote a good article there recently enough about where coaching is at and where it might go over the next 10 years and some of the challenges it faces in your mind, uh, from your viewpoint, where do you see coaching evolving to over the coming years? I, I would love, I would love to see us having to at Kingston college, having to completely re-examine what we do in 10 years from now. And, and I would like that to be the case because 
the big elements of coaching are now being taught at second level in schools. That's the conversation I'd love to be having with you in 10 years time where I, I explain to you how we're reinventing what we teach because we don't need to teach it anymore. That, that would be me ethically telling you and authentically telling you what I would love to see happen to the planet um, is that we, we all become far more aware as human beings and that we we're having those conversations and we're truly, truly listening to each other. Um, that's where I would love to see coaching going. Will it get there that quickly? I don't think so. So I think we're as a as a as a provider of education in that space, I think we're going to be around for for quite a bit longer. Um, the, the the concerns I would have about coaching would be how it's misused and misrepresented sometimes. About how some people present themselves as a coach, but what they're really doing is training. So therefore they're not listening, they're telling. And and then there's there's a branding of coaching that 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 has has got out there that is is not really in line with what it is um that 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 would concern me and, and then of course the misuse of coaching that thankfully it's as people become more educated about what it is it doesn't happen as often but where we see coaching being used as a remedial approach where somebody has missed their targets or they have a behavioral issue and they get quote unquote sent for coaching i think that just does so much damage to the brand of the brand of coaching and and how amazing it is if we can have that performance conversation, somebody who missed their targets, rather than sending them to coaching to fix them, what if we had a coaching conversation at the start when we set the targets? And then what if we had coaching check-ins every month during that, that uh, reporting period to check in for any issues? What's going on? I'm listening to you. Tell me what's happening for you. Well, this month the market wasn't great. You know, we've experienced a bit of, a bit of a challenge here, but I'm confident next month is going to be okay. You check in next month it didn't recover okay do we need to look at this a different way if you have a leader asking those questions and having those kind of conversations that avoids the employee who's sitting at their desk going i'm really concerned about having a meeting with conal because he's going to spot the fact of missing my targets two months in a row now you probably have seen it anyway but they don't want to face up to them and, and have that conversation mm. um that that misuse of coaching i think is is unfortunate and it's damaging but I also think it's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah, and again, you're preaching to the converted here. I completely agree. Like, so I've said that all the time, but but I do. And, and I've seen it so many times, even in interviews with people who have 15, 20 years experience in the enablement or training space, who then come for a coaching role and think it's the same thing, but it's, it's not, it's completely different. Sorry, two last questions, Alan, but it's a fascinating conversation. Um, the first one is you're an executive coach yourself what what type of people come to you for coaching and if, if, if people do want to reach out to you i suppose two questions in one how can they how can they find you okay first thing uh, first question was who do i work with um it tends to be people who are in in, in a leadership role in, in organizations or people who are entrepreneurs so they're either starting a business or or they're trying to exit themselves from the day-to-day -day running of the business. So not, not to sell the business, but to, to, to move from that thing we talked about earlier from where they're working in the business to try and extract themselves out and start working on the business. Um, so there, there are two areas that I, I work with quite a lot. So leadership within, within organizations and, and entrepreneurs. Um, and then of course, within Kingstown College, we have, we have coaches and we have lecturers um, who, who specialize in lots of different areas. But coaches most of the time even though they might specialize in something that they enjoy working in we're kind of like general practitioners too that it would be unusual that a client would sit in front of us with with a challenge or with an ambition that we can't facilitate that conversation it would be unusual for that to happen because the, the tools that we have um are are so applicable in so many different situations uh, but if if anybody's interested in coaching um just reach out to us. I mean, the kingstowncollege.ie is our website. Um, my, my email address is learn at kingstowncollege.ie. And that comes directly into me. And if, if they want to have a conversation about one-to-one -one coaching, even just a, a, a no obligation, let's have a talk for 15 minutes and just maybe coaching isn't the thing you need. Maybe it's something different, but we'll, we'll figure that out in 15 minutes. And I'm happy to, to, to help you to find that, that direction that's right for you. Um, so for one-to-one -one coaching, if you're thinking of training your team and coaching or mentoring, uh, be it for something accredited or a short intervention. Um, if you have any challenge around around your team, your management, your leadership, 
if we don't have something straight away to help you, we can probably point you in the right direction. So at the very least, it's worth it's worth a call or it's worth an email. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And just to reiterate what you said, I I know when I went on the program or in the course that I had been coaching for a while and I'd read a lot about it. And what it allowed me to do was have greater clarity, greater structure, and then be able to communicate what I was doing to other people uh, in a in a in again in a structured way and in a way that was aligned with, aligned with ICF. But I've also seen people who would have come to the course and maybe uh, had the opportunity to experience coaching for the first time, and it was a life changing experience for them. Which coaching has been for me, but I think it had kind of happened prior to my time coming to Kingstown, if you get what I'm saying. So I, I definitely highly recommend it. And, and maybe if I can just summarize very quickly, Alan, I think there's four or five key takeaways for me from, from today's chat. But initially, what you started talking about was was learning, the, the continuous learning, which is so important. You meant we we had an in-depth conversation about values, which I'm so aligned with. And uh, it's something that I spend time on every week, just trying to redefine and, and re-clarify my values. Spoke about emotional intelligence and then the key elements of coaching, which are listening and questioning. And that coaching isn't something that happens in a room behind a closed door, sitting on a couch. It's 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 a way of talking, a way of communicating, a way of doing business. I, I think that sums it up. <laughs> That's pretty much on the mark. Cool. That was a brilliant chat, Alan, which I, I didn't expect it to take any of those turns, but it did. So it just shows you. <laughs> it was it was certainly, it was fluid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big time. All right, good man. Thanks, William, for joining us. Thanks, Cole. Pleasure. Excellent. Great stuff there from Alan. Really enjoyed that. And if you want to uh, learn more about Kingstown College, please head over to their website or reach out to Alan there directly as well yourself and he can hit you in the right direction. Okay, have a nice weekend. Chat to you again next week. And remember, whatever you're doing, get involved.